All right, guys, we're live now. Okay, can I just uh, welcome uh, once again a very special guest who's been pretty busy, um, but we haven't seen her face for a while because we had all kinds of people present with me. Um, I wanted to um, welcome Marta, who's um, in Woods, all Hello. the way in Poland. Hi, hi. Um, what's going on for you guys? It looks like it's summer. Has summer arrived now? Yeah, summer has arrived and and we there's hot, uh, there's green because we had many rainy days in Poland and mm -hmm. now it's hot. So every everything is green. We have uh, markets full of strawberries, you know, it's I think it's beautiful. <laughs> no, I am very, very jealous. I'm very jealous, <laughs> I have to say, because um, normally i travel to europe you know may between may and sort of september and I, I can't travel but as soon as i can i'll definitely be there and um how is the situation um generally speaking i know that um pretty much everything's gone back to normal as far as uh, offices and postal services and all of that can you just give us a bit more in information about what's happening Mm, yes, it's, it's, I think that we are getting back to normal life, like uh, everything is open, almost everything is open, even swimming pools and, uh, you know, theaters, so I think that we are getting back to normals at, and uh, offices also are working quite normal, they are changing uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. So they are not like everybody is in, at work at the office, but but they work quite normal. So they, they'd be working remotely. So I know that until yeah. the 23rd of May, Poland was in a, like a state of emergency, essentially, right? So some yeah. of the government's services were suspended, but a lot of people were working from home and they catching up. There's a little bit of backlog, but I, I don't think it's anything too severe, yeah? Yes, yes. It's now... Now, like everybody wants to go to work <laughs> and not sitting at home. So, so I think that everybody is working like uh, normal now. Okay, interesting. Because the holiday seasons are coming up as well. So normally between sort of June and September, people go and leave. But kind of, you know, everybody was at home for a long time. So maybe, maybe people will travel in Poland more than overseas. Do you think that's what's going to yes. happen? Right. Yes, it, uh, I think that, uh, that it will happen because uh, the borders are open, but not all the borders are open. So Poland opened to, to all the European Union countries, but not every U European Union country opened to Poland. Right. So it's quite complicated okay. now to travel abroad. Well, that's why I'm not there eating strawberries. Um, but, you know, as soon as I can, as soon as I can. So, look, we're going to get started. So today we, uh, we're really, really privileged to have you talk to us again. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting topic that has um, garnered a, a lot of uh, interest and response because we're going to be talking about a topic that might appear a bit dry, but this is where uh, the real fun begins when we... Um, look at people's um, applications for confirmation of Polish citizenship. So what we're going to be talking to everybody today about is what sort of documents um, one needs to apply to confirm their Polish citizenship. Um, so I might um, hand over to you, um, but the first thing I wanted to ask you is, um, could you show us what it looks like? Because we, we keep talking about this confirmation of Polish citizenship, but what is it and what does it look like? Uh, so I prepare a presentation with Andrea. So I have an example of, of the decision of the confirmation of the citizenship. So it's okay. like that. Okay. And the decision is issued by a uh, voivod and uh, as we have 16 voivodship offices in Poland, it may be differ depending on which voivod or issued it, mm -hmm. but uh, it always contains uh, the designation of the administrative body and mm -hmm. it's here. It always contains signature of the voivod and it's here. Mm -hmm. And it always contain also the designation of the applicant, and it is here. 
but uh, I think that the most important part of this decision is the sentence, mm -hmm. um, the sentence of co confirmation of Polish citizenship, and it's there. Okay, and that actually says, and we, we made this one up, of course, it's not a real one, but uh, it says that Anna Kowalska, daughter of Jan and Ter Ter Teresa Ney Novak, born in New York, and there's a date there, has Polish citizenship since birth. And I think, yes. um, you know, when I when I talk to prospective clients, I explain to them that when the, this certificate, this priceless certificate is issued, um, it is from birth that people get it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, um, so all right. Mm -hmm. You may see uh, that there is a lot of text uh, under, but uh, it is, it is uh, information about, uh, about uh, possibility to apply for, uh, to, to apply for uh, the change of this decision. But, uh, you know, when we are happy with this decision, we, mm -hmm. we just don't have to use it. <laughs> no, we grab the certificate and we run. Um, but so essentially there's um, instructions or guidelines there that explain to you uh, the legal basis for which the decision was issued. Um, so that's above, right? And then below it says that if you're not happy with the outcome of this decision, you can appeal. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. So that's all. This, this, it's, one, it's usually one page. So. so we were hoping that you are now going to show us the actual application form because that, that is a big headache, isn't it? Um, uh, yes. Right. Yes, it's, that's true because uh, the application for confirmation of Polish citizenship uh, has 12 pages. Mm -hmm. It's in Polish and uh, it has to be completed in Polish. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of information to, to fill in. And on the first page, we, we have a part that we, are, uh, we have to uh, put the address of the applicant. Mm -hmm. We have to um, say if we are uh, applying for confirmation or if we are applying for uh, not confirmation uh, for confirmation of uh, the loss of citizenship so it's quite you know a bit strange but, but right it is. so tell me why would people be applying to have um to, to have confirmation that they lost their citizenship typically <sighs> I sometimes it happens. It's sometimes the uh, some of the judicial uh, procedures needs um, this confirmation. So uh, it, it, when the status citizenship status needs to be cleared, it is no matter if you have citizenship or if you don't have citizenship. It has to be cleared. Okay. So, Okay, so I just want, wanted to remind you of one particular case. I can't remember whether it was you or the writer that worked on it, but this was for a, for a politician in Australia. Uh, and we had to actually, um, uh, we, we didn't go as far as getting this, this through, but we had to provide proof that somebody didn't have Polish citizenship because they were standing for parliament, for federal. So sometimes... Yeah. Um, but, you know, whatever happens to a person's professional life, let's say, um, needs that confirmation that they don't hold Polish citizenship yet. Yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's necessary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, further, we have, to, we have to complete this form with the details of the applicant, mm -hmm. with the details of their uh, mother, father, and both uh, maternal and paternal grandparents. So, it's there and uh, the next uh, space is for brief biography of the applicant but also oh wow uh, <laughs> yeah but also of uh, the applicant parents and both maternal and paternal grandparents yeah i wanted so, i wanted to say that sorry to interrupt you Marta, but sometimes people ask us why do you need to know this information um but sometimes there are good reasons for why, why we need to know that, right? First of all, because we need to put it in, into this form, but there are other reasons, right? Uh, so basically we have to put, put this information in this form. We don't, 
uh, it's not possible to leave uh, this this place like no information. Mm -hmm. We have to put some information in all 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 of these uh, windows. Mm -hmm. So um, it serves like to th this information about the other part of the family serves to prove that there was no reason to lose citizenship. So okay. there was no cir circumstances uh, that may have that may uh, cause the loss of citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that it's finished. Oh, okay. There are information about how to how to complete this uh, application, but the uh, they are also in Polish. Okay, they're pretty complicated. Yeah, I, I would probably struggle filling filling this in. Luckily, I don't have to. Yeah. All right. Yes, so we it's can. Complicated. Um, so now that we've seen it. Um, and we know more or less what sort of information we have to provide and it's on both sides of the family and we have to go back all the way to great grandparents. Um, I, when, you know, when I speak to, to prospective clients, um, one of the first questions anybody asks me is what sort of documents do I need to provide? And not just that, they often say, I have my grandmother's birth certificate, am I Polish? Um, what would you answer um, to that sort of a question, Marta? Uh, I would answer that uh, the birth certificate of grandmother is a good start, but not enough. Okay. Uh, it's a good start to, to search another documents. It's a good start, start to analyze the case. Uh, but um, in, in the most cases, there, it's not enough to confirm Polish citizenship. Okay. And could you tell us why a birth certificate alone isn't um, enough of a proof of Polish citizenship? Because birth certificate is uh, it is a proof that someone that someone uh, was birthed, and uh, that the birth uh, uh, and and that, that the person uh, birth uh, on definite date, on definite uh -huh. place, and from definite parents. Uh -huh. But there is no confirmation of Polish citizenship there. Okay, so in other words, you could be born anywhere. You could be born outside of Poland and be Polish, or you could be born in Poland, but unless both or one of your parents are Polish, you're not Polish. So um, I, I think um, what we could sort of summarize here is that um, uh, a birth certificate might contain uh, relevant information, but mostly yes. it just it just proves who you are as a person, as strange as it sounds, that you exist, that you were born, uh, on what date, where, and who your parents are, uh, but not... It, it will not say, say in what, what citizenship you hold. Um, yes, exactly. Right. But okay. sometimes, sometimes birth certificates uh, from from Poland um, may have more information and mm -hmm. may have served to to prove, uh, for example, like they, that someone lived in Poland. So I will show you the the examples of of that birth certificates that uh, that is not only the proof of that someone was birth was born um, there okay so um uh, we we've seen the form but but does poland uh, or does the polish government give the applicant a checklist of what they have to submit no no okay. they don't give a checklist because because each case is different and uh, each case needs uh, to be deeply analyzed and only then uh, there is there is a possibility to create a list of documents that uh, that will be needed in this case uh, so it it works it works it is worth to say that uh, this checklist this list may change uh, after you you lodge subsequent documents because okay. Um, sometimes from these documents, uh, you can see that another document will be needed. So, for example, when uh, you lodge your grandparent uh, naturalization from Australia, and in this naturalization, there will be an information about uh, the fact that your grandparents was naturalized as British, right. you, will, you will have to lodge British naturalization. So this list may change. Right, so we, um, we 
do our best to give our clients um, uh, information about what they need to supply. And some, some of the information are essential for everybody. So birth, marriage, yeah. um, you know, ancestral documents. But um, other than that, it depends, I think. So maybe you could um, show us what types of documents, because wh when we were working on this presentation, we, we said, okay, we can, we can show you a range or a type, uh, types of documents that you would um, typically need. Uh, because as you said, there's no checklist and each case is different. So perhaps you could take us through what sort of documents, um, um, you know, we use. Yes. So uh, I want to show you the direct proofs, uh, proofs of Polish citizenship. And there is a one. It's a Polish ID with oh, wow. confirmation. Yes, yes. Uh, with the confirmation of Polish citizenship. And it's here. Uh, so we may have, we may find uh, Polish ID uh, without it, and then it will not serve as a proof of Polish citizenship. Uh, but when this place is filled, it's very good proof, and we 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 may to use it in 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 procedure. Um, there is also information about, about uh, the surname, about the name, about uh, date of birth, about place of birth. So there is a lot of information in, in, this, in, in this one document. Mm. And uh, sometimes it's enough mm. to prove Polish citizenship. But of course, what I wanted to add here is because these documents were uh, written by hand by um, people that had discretion about what they were going to put there. You might have a person that was, you know, born in exactly the same year and exactly the same town and got the, exactly the same document, but it'll be different because it was filled in differently. So uh, when the Polish government looks at it, they uh, they look at detail and very, very minute detail. Uh, and, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that person may be eligible, other times they may not, or it might go through quickly, other times it will not. It just really depends. Yeah, it depends yeah. of all the circumstances of the case. So mm. this document is a good proof, but we have to analyze all of, of other circumstances which appear in, in, in particular case. Mm -hmm. So another proof uh, of Polish citizenship is, of course, po of course Polish passport. Oh, yes. Um, wow. Yeah. And it also contains uh, information about the name and surname, about the date of birth, place of birth. And of course, it itself is, it is a proof of Polish citizenship. And uh, what I wanted to say uh, is that this Polish passport was found in Australian archives. So uh, it's good to know that, uh, it's good to know for people that, uh, especially when your ancestor leave uh, Poland before the war, there is a chance to find those documents in foreign archives. So it's good to know, know to, uh, that that you have to look in the foreign archives and find and find some documents for your ancestors, because you may have. Something like that. Right. And that kind of document kind of, uh, you know, solves your issue. Like if you, if you can find something like this, like the one you showed us before and something like this, um, then that's your problem solved because you could only hold a document like that if you held Polish citizenship. You yes, know, your, your exactly. ancestors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So another, another example of the document which was found in foreign archives is Polish, Polish birth certificate. It was found uh, by the client in Argentinian archives. Oh, wow. So, so yes, so yes, sometimes you could, you could find Polish, Polish documents in foreign archives. And it will be all, also a good proof, but this is a proof that someone was uh, born in Poland. Okay. But if we don't if we don't have Polish passport or Polish ID, uh, we have to look for another documents, and we are always starting with searching for uh, for metrical documents. So we always start with searching for birth certificate, marriage certificates uh, in Poland, and here's uh, an example of Polish birth certificate. It is written in po Polish. It's quite, uh, you know, nice 
handwritten. Yes. And you can you can easily read it. A lot of so, detail. Uh, yes, there is a lot of detail because there is a name of the father. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a name of the mother and there is the name of the child. But there is also information that this father uh, was uh, has uh, 30 years old. Oh, and, yeah. yeah, and that he was a teacher mm. and that he lived in Łódź, but his legal place of residence was uh, in another place, in Rudańce. Okay. So... This, this, this document contains much more information oh. and it may serve to prove, not directly, but it may save, serve also to prove uh, Polish citizenship. Because when someone uh, has had a place of residence in Poland, we may, uh, we may say that uh, not 100%, but that this person may have Polish citizenship. So, like I said, it's handwritten, but uh, it's quite e easy to read. Mm. But <laughs> oh my god, there is a lot so of yeah, wow. there is a lot of documents like that, and it's not easy to read them. What language is this? This is Polish, yeah. It's Polish, it's Polish, it's Polish, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know who 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 wrote it, who wrote it. M maybe uh, me. I have very bad handwriting. <laughs> So it is marriage certificate and oh, wow. it is written in, in Polish. We have also here uh, the information about, about, uh, about a man, about a woman. Mm -hmm. So when we are looking at it, we, we, we could have this, all this information, but it's good to know that sometimes uh, you may have additional, uh, additional information uh, like this. On the margins, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Can you see what margins. that says? What, what does it say? Yes, that one of the person who got married died uh, on a particular date. I, I think that is 1983. Ah, yeah. So this information may serve to to do further research, to search another document. Mm -hmm. So basically, somebody in the office, in the civil registry office, went back to a document that was created when these people married and then made a note on the margin that somebody, um, that one of the spouses died, yeah, basically. Yes, yes, exactly. So it's, it's a document in Polish, but also in oh, Poland, wow. Uh, we may find because uh, when we search for documents which was created before um, 1920, the documents were created in the languages of uh, partitioner uh, countries. So we may find documents in German and it's birth certificate. So that one is in German, yeah. Okay. Yes, that one is, is in yeah. German and also in Latin. Oh, wow. And that's pretty messy handwriting too, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's quite messy. It's in Latin it's, and it contains not much information, but even this document contains the information about the number of the house uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, at which uh, these people lived. Oh, wow. Okay. So this information is here and it may serve to search. Uh, we have uh, some, some kind of address. So we may search for residential records uh, in archives with this information. And can I just ask you, because the, the, the other interesting thing with this particular document is that the names are written in Latin. So you have, um, forgive my pronunciation, Johannes, Johannes and Nicolaus Johannes. Uh, and Josephus, Josephus. Um, so they yeah. kind of, when they were creating these documents, they also translated the names from Polish, which clearly these people were, into Latin. But that probably yes, creates exactly. a, a lot of confusion too, no? I don't think so. I was learning Latin like for, I think, two years. And okay. I, am able, I am able to read it. So it's, it's, it's not a big problem. Latin is, is, uh, is quite, no. Okay, maybe not, but it's easy. It's like German. Sometimes. Right. Uh, and we have also uh, metrical documents in Russian, and that one I cannot read. Not even you can think. read it? No? Wow. No. That's in a very uh, sort of antiquated handwriting, yeah? Yes, uh, but 
there is, uh, you know, the name of the parties because it is a marriage certificate. Oh, yeah, that's in Polish. Also in Polish. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I may have knowledge uh, about what people are involved in this marriage. So sometimes, I mean, I've seen, and I'm sure you have seen too, that there are sometimes documents that are issued in several languages. So you might have, um, uh, you know, the form itself might be in Russian. I think you're going to be showing that shortly. And then there are annotations in sometimes German, Yiddish, Hebrew. Like sometimes you need four different translators to tell us what the document says. Yes, exactly, because you, it's like uh, that the document was created on the particular date and sometimes officials made, uh, made the notes uh, like later. And that's why uh, they make notes uh, at another language. Mm -hmm. and, but one thing that is worth to say about these documents that this, th all of these documents, all of these metrical documents are originals. So uh, it's worth okay. to know that there's only one original and it, is, it was created, it was always created by, by a civil registry office or a priest mm -hmm. and it always stays in the civil registry office. So every document we, we may have later, it's only an extract or duplicate. So they, they put everything in books, yeah? Or, well, they don't anymore, but they used to have books in, into which, so that one, for example, that says number six. Um, yes. In, in like a in line of In, in this year, in mm. that book. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. And this original documents uh, always contains more information, but only about the birth, date of birth, mm. place of birth. So it's always a uh, word to look for these documents, not only for, for later extracts or duplicates. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, so another proof of uh, Polish uh, citizenship is of course army book. Uh, because uh, if someone serve in Polish army, we, 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 we are sure that he had Polish citizenship. So it's mm -hmm. example of, of this army book. And we may look for it in state archives in Poland. Uh, it's hard to find them, but sometimes it's possible. Uh, so that's the yeah. ultimate proof that somebody was Polish, essentially, yes. they yes. served in the army. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's also some, some kind of direct proof. But when we don't have uh, the access, we, we can't find direct proofs of Polish citizenship. We are always looking for looking for another uh, documents for for like for example this. This uh -huh. is a registration card uh, um, which was created after the war, uh -huh. and uh, these cards were cre were created for Jewish people who uh, who were in Poland just after the war. And uh, there is not a lot of information because there is a, a surname, name, name of the parents, but every information could serve to, to, to search for another documents. And uh, in this particular documentation, doc document, we may uh, see that this person had uh, also the army book and there is a number of this army book. So, it's also quite a good document for mm. us. So somebody just made a note, um, and, and, and of course, when they did, they didn't think of what, what they were writing, essentially. They just wrote, so all of these cards um, were issued to Jewish people that were looking for survivors, basically, and they, some of them returned to Poland uh, to see who survived. Um, some people immigrated straight after that. Um, but they were creating these survivor cards to put families together and see, yeah. see who, who survived, essentially. So you can see in that, that the form's the same, but what people wrote on it is different case by case as well. Yes, exactly. Mm. And there we can see that this person survived in woods, for example. Mm -hmm. There is his current address. So it's an address from uh, 1936. Uh, he lived in Bitom mm -hmm. uh, at Platz. I don't know. It's uh, Volnoshi. Yes, Volnoshi. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. 
so it's quite good information to make to to uh, to make further research but mm. it's also a quite good evidence of of the fact that he was serving in polish army and that he uh, had army book and that he had Polish citizenship. Because mm. this particular institution um, is uh, the Jewish Historical Institute, but after the war, it was part of a government um, uh, department. And they were, you know, in charge of managing survivors, I guess is the best way to, uh, and registering them so that they could be mm -hmm. uh, rehoused or helped immigrate or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. and so that's why this sort of document is also quite valuable, right? Yes. Yes, yes, it's very valuable for us. Um, and another sort of documents uh, is, of course, residential records for in Poland, because, uh, you know, the residential records prove itself that someone has a legal residence in Poland. And when someone has had legal residence uh, in Poland, we may uh, presume that uh, he was a Polish citizenship. So in this particular uh, card, you have information about surname, name, name mm -hmm. of the parents, and the place and the date of birth. But also there is an information that this person had Polish ID. So this information is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, this document is also is also kind of proof that someone had Polish citizenship. Mm -hmm. Uh, this document is uh, created in Polish, but uh, it's, it, it is also oh, wow. a residential card. But, you know, it's look like uh, here we have um, uh, Russian, mm -hmm. but the names of the people uh, are in Polish. So we may say that the uh, official who created this card uh, used Russian forms, old forms, and uh, and uh, put the information about people uh, in Polish. This is really interesting because this is created in 1931. So they must have used um, the old books from from before partitions for a long time, right? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. They were they were they were recycling even back then. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's all, it, it is also quite good evidence uh, of, of the residence in Poland and also of, of the Polish citizenship. But sometimes, uh, sometimes we have just situation when we can't, can't find anything. So we have situation like, uh, you know, uh, the, the church was burned or the community which lived uh, on particular territory when they are leaving, they uh, they take all the books, all the documents they can with 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 them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we we just can't find any birth certificates, any any other uh, documents. But when we have when we are luck, we can find something like this. It's oh, wow. a card from uh, inheritance case. Mm -hmm. It's the death certificate, uh, but. We have here the information about the father, about uh, his son, about the place of birth, the date of birth, and about that that the father was um, that the father place of residence was in Shanka, right. and that the father had Polish citizenship. So we we. We were lucky in this case. Yeah. So this is from the National Archives of Poland, but essentially what it is, it's a it's a notary um, document, like a notarial mm -hmm. deed, um, uh, like minutes of, um, of of inheritance and and also somebody's death. Uh, yes. And these kinds of documents will also have a lot of useful information, um, and they hard to find, but you know sometimes they do exist. Yes, yes, and with it may serve as a proof uh, of Polish citizenship without birth certificates, marriage certificates, you know, because the, the voivodeship office sometimes uh, they understand that uh, sometimes we can have uh, problems with finding documents. It's mm -hmm. obvious for them mm -hmm. sometimes. 
So can I just ask you there, Marta, because you've touched on, and we have had a couple of cases where we've looked everywhere and we just cannot find a birth certificate. Um, so this is the other side of the coin. Um, so, you know, some people say, oh, I have a birth certificate in my Polish of my grandmother, uh, but in, in other cases, they, there are lots of other documents, but not a birth certificate. So what do we do in cases like that, where we just cannot find it, either because it was destroyed or never created, because that sometimes happened too, right? Yes, exactly. So we have to find every proof to connect people, to prove kinship in another way. We don't have birth certificate, but we may have another documents to prove kinship between the people. Uh -huh. Or we may have, uh, we may find Polish document not on like grandfather, grandfather, but on the, fa but on the father. Yes, the Polish document of the father. Uh -huh. So it's, it's the way to resolve the cases like that. Mm. And they, they're quite challenging because, I mean, the easiest, <laughs> the, the easiest thing to do would be have, to have a birth certificate. But so you also have to show proof that you've looked and um, it, it, it's, it's quite complicated. And, but it does yes. sometimes happen. OK, so what, what, what's next on your slides? Um, any more documents I, that you can show us? Or is no, that it? It's the, yeah, That's it's, the it's, end. It's, it's, yeah. Very good timing, Marta, very good timing, because we um, spoke for half an hour already. So what I'm going to do is hand over to Andrea, maybe with a couple of quick questions, um, just, just to see if there's anything that people want to know specifically. But thank you very much. That, that was fascinating. Really, really interesting. Thank My you, pleasure. Marta and Eva. So there's a few questions from the audience. Our first question will be, typically, once you receive the Polish birth certificate, how long before you get your actual citizenship? So maybe I'll, I'll grab that one, Marta, if you don't mind. So these are two different things. So when you apply to have your citizenship confirmed, you get a certificate of citizenship. That's done through the Voivodeship Office. So that's kind of one leg of the journey. At the same time, you have to register your vital records. So your birth certificate and marriage certificate if you're married. If you happen to, to be divorced, you also have to register your divorce. If you've changed your name, you have to change your, um, your um, name in Poland as well, because all the documents have to match. So before you can apply for a passport, you have to get your citizenship certificate, birth certificate and marriage or whatever else. And something that's called a PESEL number, which is like a social security number. So the procedures that I've just described are completely different and they happen through different offices. So um, citizenship certificate typically takes between eight to 12 months, sometimes a bit longer. Mm -hmm. Registration of a birth certificate, six to 10 weeks, um, sometimes longer, depending on from which country, et cetera. But that's a, that's a completely different procedure, but you need them both to apply for a passport. Thank you. Uh, next question. Can documents from a church in or outside Poland, let's say German War Camp George, can be considered first grade documents for an application for citizenship? Actually, it may serve, uh, but not as direct proof. We have always to, we have always to look for if it is a church document, nor not civil document we have to look for for uh, for this document in Poland as well yeah then maybe I'll, I'll just add there so I think what the person's asking about is documents created in Germany so um, you know a lot of Polish people when we're talking about hundreds of thousands if not millions ended up as displaced people in Germany and often they were undocumented they had no documents whatsoever so the documents we're talking about here were created based on people's verbal statements. So Poland yes. can't, can't necessarily trust documents like that, not, not because they uh, are particularly mean or, or, or trying to be difficult, but you know, we have had cases of mistaken identities or you know, if people were young, if they were orphans, sometimes they didn't know what their names were. So um, these documents are created based on verbal statements or witness statements. Um, and, you know, let me tell you, we've had bigamies, we've had all kinds of things. So Poland doesn't rely on those documents um, as well as documents created in Poland because they're kind of mm -hmm. secondary. And anything that was created in Canada, America, Australia, or anywhere that people immigrated to, they also not considered direct proof, as, as Marta said. Um, and church records, it depends where. So let's say you have a marriage certificate from Italy, um, that's from a, a church, 
that's the only document you could have got because there was no other way to get married um, in, in Italy, in, you know, within some, some time frames. So the answer to that is all depends, but generally speaking, I don't know if you would agree, Marta, is that they're not considered as strong or as, uh, yes. as, as yes. direct as others, yeah? Yes, exactly, that's what I mean. Okay. We have a question regarding the application form. Uh, do we have to attach supporting documents for each question in the application form for confirmation of citizenship? It's it's not quite easy to to answer this question, but basically yes. We when we when we uh, complete this form with the information about the the birth and the place of birth of the applicant, we uh, have to attach his birth certificate and also parents' marriage certificate. So we have to attach all the documents which prove uh, the things we we put into this form. Maybe if I step in, I'm sorry, I keep on talking too much, but I, I, um, I think I understand the question. So let's say it's your mom or your dad that are Polish. You still have to explain everybody above them. So you have into the form, you have to put who your grandparents are, your great grandparents, but you don't necessarily have to provide documents to prove that they, is that fair to say? Is, am I explaining this correctly? Because if, if it's your mom that was born in Poland, you might not need to go above her. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's say she was born in Poland and she was 22 when she left and you have all the documentation to prove that she was Polish. Yes, um, that's enough. Right, yeah. but in the form you have to provide explanation, but not necessarily documentation to go back, um, you know, generations. To, to all, yeah. Right. Yes. It's just really yes. depending who you're relying on uh, and who you're pursuing the application under. Thank you so much, guys. One last question. Once my application for Polish citizenship has been lodged, can a case officer require extra documents? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> Yes, of course. Uh, they uh, so the voivodeship office. Uh, um, it's quite uh, normal that they require uh, additional documents, and sometimes we have to lodge them because uh, you know they are right. But sometimes they are not right, and we are trying to discuss with them to to avoid apply, uh, you know, like uh, lodging another documents because we are thinking that that's enough, we lodged enough. Yeah. So yesterday, when we were preparing for this session, we um, sort of estimated that in about fifty percent of cases, we will be asked for extra documents. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe me, we do our absolute best to give them everything that they might ever want. Uh, but still, each case officer will have a slightly different way of um, processing the case or different questions they might have. So it's not a cookie cutter sort of um, process. They do look at every case individually within the legislation. So that there's a framework around the legislation. But what happens um, with your application really depends on what you gave them. And as Marta very eloquently explained, um, you know, the types of documents we'll be providing will vary across every application. So the questions that they might have will, will also vary. Um, so about 50% of applications go through. The other 50, um, look, you know, sometimes the questions are, are really challenging to answer uh, and unpredictable. Um, so I'll, I'll let uh, Marta maybe um, talk about that a little um, because that that's probably, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but that's probably the most frustrating part of the job trying to, uh, not that we argue with the Polish government, we, we don't, uh, but, you know, yeah. show them something. So maybe you could expand on that a little. So there, there's, there, there are situations where when they are asking, like, you know, when we are lodging the birth certificate of the person and in this birth certificate, there's an information about the marriage uh, of, of the person parents. So, uh, if it is, especially if it is after 1951, it's not necessary to lodge, to lodge the marriage certificate itself. So we are discussing them about, uh, with them about it, that it's not necessary to lodge this marriage certificate. It's not the point. Mm. So, 
they, they, it, this may be uh, like for example, but the, you know, these examples are many when we are uh, discussing with them. Right, so it's a bit of sort of pushing and shoving in a very diplomatic and gentle way. Um, but what, what one thing I didn't say, uh, Marta, earlier is your um, your credentials, because you actually specialize in administrative law, don't you? So I guess, um, you know, not that I want to say that, you know, better than everybody else, but you, you are really well, well versed, um, uh, you know, it inside out and upside down, um, the, the law that we apply to these applications, is that right? So I'm a specialist of an administrative uh, procedure. So uh, it, it, it is my specialization and uh, I, I may move in, in this area so like quite slightly. And I can discuss, I can, I can make an argument uh, in this area as well. And you usually win, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Look, we have run out of time about, you know, 15 minutes ago, but I, I found it really fascinating. Uh, again, thank you so much for, uh, you know, dedicating your time and putting this together, because I think, you know, when you see these things visually, um, it's so much easier to relate to it than, than just talk about it. And I think what we've done today, what you have done today is explain um, why it's such a complex process. And, um, you know why uh, every case is different um, and also that the duration of it might be affected the way that the case is managed might be affected depending on who who your ancestors are and what sort of documents we start with before we go and before i thank you properly for uh, for all that you've done today i also wanted to say one thing that um often when we when our cases are stuck you know some small percentage of cases is kind of stuck in, in limbo mm -hmm. We go back to, to the applicant and we say, look, talk to your family. Maybe they have something. And then they come back with a box of beautiful <laughs> polished documents. I've seen it quite a few times. Um, yeah. And, and now, nowadays we've learned to say to people before they even start, look, talk to everybody. Because if there's a, a cupboard, a box or something with polished documents, that, that's really, really helpful. And sometimes people do have them. So it's your home archives that might have, you know, what we need. Yes, it may have treasure <laughs> yes uh, but look thank you again um sincerely for your time for your expertise um and anybody that's listened and wants to reach out to you or to me or anybody else at polarani can uh we do um conduct um eligibility assessment free of charge and we we, we tell people what we think their chances are and as you heard today uh marta is definitely uh, an expert uh, and we often rely on her uh, with really sort of curly, really complex cases, which uh, are many, many, because people's history um, histories are complex. So thank you again. Uh, I wish you a very good day. Enjoy the summer and strawberries. Thank you, Eva. It was my pleasure also. Okay, we'll see you soon, uh, very, very soon. <laughs> I hope okay, so. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye.